This is the right time of the visa. Yes. It's on the leaves. Yes. Is yes. the volume okay? Just be No, no, it's that one. Of offenders in the in the United Kingdom, and that part of what the previous speakers outlines is to uh, to address that problem. I'd like to add that the, the work with the police is, is crucial in identifying offenders' children at the earliest possible time um, within the within the judicial process. I'd like to move on to pre-trial detention and say that um, they, there should be and there are examples of post-trial alternatives to custody um, around the world um, in, in, in places like Washington State in the United States. Um, um, there should be um, a focus on pre-trial alternatives to, to custody as well, um, but where, where custody has to be, um, where custody is, a, a, is, is essential, uh, access for children of incarcerated parents to the custodial environment that their parent is in, or access to, um, to the community by the incarcerated parent 
uh, must be promoted, and in, in many jurisdictions that's not promoted, particularly at the, the pre-trial stage of the, of the process. And, and I think at that early stage, then the links need to be, um, needs to be uh, maintained between the family or the children and the incarcerated parent in, in prison. But one point that will run throughout this discussion is what's missing from the United Kingdom is an identification of children throughout the process. So not just to ask the question in the courts, but to ask at the police station, the courts, the prison, and then when they move forward throughout the system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh the, la the last lady and next and you, okay. Diane Newell, Open Society Institute of New York. Um, I work in the U.S. in 14 states and I wanted to say that um, we have developed um, arrest protocols uh, in 215 different communities uh, along with law enforcement training around the issues of uh, developmental uh, differences among children and one of the things we try to preserve is the constitutional right of the arrested parent to designate who will be the caregiver and then law enforcement uh, we give them two options so that we try to get a timely caregiver to arrive and then um, it's documented in the police um, arrest format that um, uh, where the children went and how to contact them and there is usually a follow-up by social services to ensure that they have all the information resources that are needed and that the home looks safe and, and appropriate um, but I think it's cr the critical piece of this is that we've got research data Susan D Phillips out of Jane Addams College of of social work at the University of Illinois at Chicago has done the research that confirms that witnessing a parent's arrest or any family member's arrest in your own home is uh, of a significant uh, traumatic experience for the children. So that um, it reinforces the need to mitigate um, the kind of ways that we hear that law enforcement arrest uh, parents and they always must look for evidence of other children so that they're not overlooking children that may not be present. Uh, next lady, please. Yes. Yes, hello. Liz Eyre from Eurochips, European Network for Children of Imprisoned Parents. Um, just with, with respect to upholding the dignity of the child, um, your chips would recommend that governments be guided, guided in legislation and policy by an overarching principle that the parent should not be humiliated in front of the child throughout the criminal justice process, which is particularly relevant during the time of arrest. Uh, in, in Poland, for example, we spoke with members of the police force that actually made a, a point of taking the child into another room during the arrest, especially trained uh, contact officers who took the child into another room. Thank you. Please. Rebecca Chung, Partners of Prisoners and Family Support Group from the UK. Um, just following on from other representatives within the UK, um, POPs is a user-led charity and has very much been involved in promoting the user voice in the UK. And I'd just like to make reference to Article 12, um, the child capable of forming his or her own views has the right to express those views freely in all manners affecting the child. And our recommendation to the committee would centre around this point that a child um, affected by imprisonment um, at the pre-sentence stage um, should have some form of input, not merely that their best interests are taken into consideration, but they are involved some way um, in the discussions and decisions that relate to their care and residential status following a parent's incarceration. And we would welcome the preparation of guidance in relation to this. Thank you. Uh, who else? Ah, oh, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Schaaf Smith. I come from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. I think there's no doubt that the uh, the arrest situation and, and, and the case of pre-trial imprisonment are two of the areas most neglected in terms of taking care of, of uh, children of imprisoned parents and securing their rights. I would just like to mention briefly uh, concerning arrest. Um, as we all know, there are examples from, from many, many countries, from research, etc., uh, uh, showing how difficult the situation it, it, it often turns into for the, for the, for the children involved. 
Uh, what we did in some of the Danish research I've been involved in is that we asked the police also very thoroughly how, how they saw the situation. And uh, that was quite interesting because they, they confirmed all the other results, so to speak, how difficult the situation it was instead of rejecting it. Uh, and, um, and we uh, have uh, engaged the police on that uh, note, positive note, so to speak. They, it, it turned out there was a very difficult situation for many police officers and many told about their very traumatic experiences going way, way back with the difficult arrests where uh, children for some reason or another were uh, involved. And on that note, we engaged the police and uh, we've uh, made educational material for them, etc. And uh, so I think there's, there's good scope, at least in some places, to work actively uh, with the police. Of course, still we need the legal framework, etc., to be in place. That's, that's extremely important, but there's also scope for, uh, for proactive work, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, up, please, do low chai and up, do after, okay? Lucy Gamble from Eurochips, uh, European Children in Prisons uh, Network. I'd like to make a, a point really about the need to protect the rights of the child and in fact to give them precedent um, over and above the rights of parents. And I think this is particularly key when we're talking about children with prison parents. For example, the child's right to information about the whereabouts of their parent, whether it's um, whether they've been arrested and taken into a police cell, whether they've been put into custody on remand. Um, certainly in the UK, they don't have that right. They only get to hear about it if the parent wishes to disclose that information. The right to be free from discrimination, which is often completely um, ignored, particularly by the media in many countries who identify people who've been arrested. And it comes back to the point the Indian, the lady from India made about, particularly if it's a serious offense, the uh, stigmatization that comes from completely inappropriate media coverage where children are not, uh, they're not protected from being identified through that um, and the right to contact with their parent once they are in prison again in many countries it's the parent that has the right to contact and not the child and children are prevented from visiting or it can take them a very long time to go through the protocols of getting access to the to their parent so it's a it's a plea for the rights of the child to be given precedent Um, my name is Julia Morgan. I'm from Plymouth University in the UK. Um, what I wanted to go back to was the um, the the uh, around dignity, um, and um, we spoke about the dignity of the parent. Not that that wasn't compromised in front of the children. Um, what what I was um, focusing on was the dignity of the child as well. Uh, for example, if the child isn't aware um, that the parent has been arrested, who would go to inform the child that the parent had been arrested? How would that be undertaken? Um, in what circumstances? How, how would that occur? What would they take into account? Um, and, and so on. So that there wasn't necessarily an outing of the child in inappropriate circumstances. And what I would say there, that um, the dignity of the child would need to be taken into account, but also that children should be involved in how, how this should be um, undertaken. Um, children who've been through those situations should um, be involved in the protocols um, that, are, that are written. Thank you. Thank you. Who is it? Oh, please. You and you after. Okay. Thank you. My name is Mina Enawala. I work for an organization called Children and Families Across Borders. Uh, we're part of the wider network for international social work and we deal with, uh, with international social work issues. The point I would like to make and ask the committee to consider is the vast implications for foreign prisoners. So these are um, adults who have crossed international borders are arrested in another jurisdiction and incarcerated. So the question is the rights for the children of children who have left behind in another jurisdiction and promoting the rights and welfare of these children. Thank you. My name is Sabine Skuta from German Red Cross and the National Coalition of uh, the Implementation of the CRC in Germany. And I would like to, to 
put the attention of the committee on the, on the possible positive effects of family counseling and the duties of family counseling in that uh, issue. Um, in Germany, we have a broad um, field of family counseling, but up to now, they don't take it for their duty and they have no education about that subject. But of course, they could take that duty and uh, every child uh, whose parent is incarcerated should uh, be given the possibility as a sort of a routine to have uh, such counseling and the rest of the family also. And this should be uh, in, uh, put into the policies or into the routines of taking a parent into arrest. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Who will be next? So I cannot see at the moment. So I, I will conclude a bit on this uh, issue. Uh, we're talking about the the, L, the LS uh, into in two part. The first part uh, for the children uh, is uh, need to be uh, a good. How to say? A good way to to address the the parents. Uh, for example, uh, many people offer uh, propose that uh, the police should not address the parents in front of the children. It means that they have to prepare social worker or anyone to help and uh, uh, separate the children into other rooms, or else they will witness for the arrest. Second part is the the way they treat the parents, uh, they, they should treat the parents well enough and should be trained or informed uh, by, uh, I mean, competent officer who know how to protect children. And the uh, other point is that uh, care and protection when the child has been, uh, I mean, uh, the parents have been arrested. Uh, that they need somebody to provide care and protection, substitute for, for their parents. Uh, moreover, I think that, uh, I mean, from, from your input, I suppose that there should be other agency concerning with child protection, such as child protective service, to go on the spot to just to try to help and support the children and their family. Okay, I, I, I just would like to end this uh, topic and would like to go on other, after the LS, I mean, during the hearing or anything like that, please. Uh, could I just make a comment? Uh, this, I'm, I'm Kirsten Sandberg from the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child and also from Norway. And just a comment to what you said uh, lastly, that the, the social, social protection authorities should also be involved. Uh, in Norway, we have uh, a system that uh, the social protection authorities are represented at the police station and go out together with the the police, if there are, um, if they have to go out to a house where there's uh, trouble with the um, drunk parents or, or lots of things going on, uh, so that the social protection officer can take care of the child if the if the parent has to be taken to the police station, and they they have this all through the night. Uh, I think always, actually. Thank you. Thank you, and and I would like to add a, a little bit more about. Uh, they should develop the methodology, how to approach how to inform the, the, the children about their parents' uh, situation or about the legal proceeding concerning with the, the allies to the children appropri appropriately, including uh, to protect their private life uh, rights. Thank you. Uh, who, okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, there are a number of um, perhaps quite specific issues um, wi around trial, pre around pre-trial measures, arrest, and then the trial and sentencing, um, which I'd like to put before you. 
Um, if, if you have general points um, on this issue as well, that's fine. But if you have specific ideas related to the issues I'm about to say, um, we'd also be very happy to hear about those. Um, in particular, in relation to arrest, there can be situations where parents will deliberately not inform the police or arresting officials that they have children because of concerns about what might happen, that the children may be taken away into state protection. Um, do people have ideas or suggestions or examples of how such situations can be resolved in the best interests of the child? For the pre-trial measures, um, we've heard about the importance of alternatives. It would be good to hear about what some of these alternatives might be and how they can be best used and which ones have the best in impacts and outcomes for the children. It would also be good to know that in the pre-trial section in particular, um, issues around the contact that children have with the parent if they are separated. Um, again, with the trial, um, there are a number of issues that it would be interesting to hear about. In particular, about the involvement of the child during the trial. In some places, children are not allowed to attend trials. In others, they are. What should happen and, what should, and how should the trials be conducted so that they are child-friendly and, um, and the children can understand, appreciate what is happening? If the children do not go to the trial for any reason, what should they be told and in how much detail? And then also, at the, at the end of the trial, at the point of sentencing and when, the, and when a sentence has been passed, um, what measures are there for contact between the parent and the child at that stage, particularly in jurisdictions where parents are taken directly from the court um, to a prison if they're being imprisoned? It's about the first question. Our experience is that, indeed, very often, parents do not, unless the children are in the, uh, the particular place, they do not actually say that they have children because they're afraid that the children will be detained, <coughs> especially for women. And these detainees are very poor very often and do not are not familiar with the law. They're afraid that because they are detained, they lose their rights over their children. And it is for this reason that in the regulations that we have prepared for the judges, there is the first stage, which is when the police force consults uh, about the uh, handover. And then there is another consultation afterwards, even when they say, no, we do not have any children. Uh, they are asked once again in the judicial headquarters, because at judicial headquarters there, there is a team of psychological and social assistants who can uh, take part and who act and who can actually see what the, uh, what the, um, about the rules and the rights. Uh, and one of the points under this paperwork that they can then see is that contact has to be maintained between the children and the parents. This doesn't resolve fully the uh, problem, but it does assist, I believe.